and, and weak labor markets. There could be a skill mismatch between the skills that migrants have and what the host labor market requires or what the labor market recognizes. Migrants could have incorrect expectations of the types of jobs that they can engage in, which will further compromise this match between jobs and uh, migrants, or they could face uh, discrimination. Uh, there's some research done by Pedro Vicente, uh, another lead academic for the IGC in Mozambique, and some of my own research that have shown how integration into labor markets, markets is really critical for the successful economic and social integration of, uh, of migrants. So this is definitely one of the, the major concerns that I would start by highlighting. Um, secondly, as you referred, um, there's the pressure that the surge in urban population can place on what is already a very weak service infrastructure, ranging from overcrowded clinics and schools to poor functioning sanitation systems and safe transport networks. Now, this is also directly tied to the problem of the limited capacity of urban planning um, in most of these municipalities and limited tax collection capabilities, which can further exacerbate this problem as there's no revenue to, uh, to improve service delivery. Um, another point that we've uh, been researching in Mozambique is how this surge in migrants can cause cohesion in cities. Uh, now, migrants may or may not push down existing workers' wages, but they can put pressure on public service delivery. Uh, they can introduce sometimes more ethnic diversity, uh, increase social unrest as well. Um, so that's another area where municipalities will, will try to have to grapple with this problem of social cohesion. Um, there's some growing concern as well on how rapid urbanization through this type of uh, rural urban migration can destabilize existing political systems. So cities um, tend to facilitate collective action and they may increase demand for democratic reform. Um, as we know, in, in several African countries, uh, it's often the case that ruling governments are consolidating their influence in rural areas while cities are sometimes bastions of the opposition parties. So while this might in the long run be a positive development, it will create some instability uh, in the short run. Um, and the very last point that I'll mention, because again, this is something that we have seen, particularly in the context of forced displacement in Mozambique, is that there's growing evidence on how climate events and natural disasters can leave severe mental scars on migrants that can be very long lasting. Um, there are some studies as I mentioned in Mozambique, there are others from Asia and Bangladesh, namely, that can show that they're kind of staggering and long lasting levels of depression system, symptoms, anxiety disorders, uh, everything associated with forced displacement. So I would point that out as an additional uh, challenge to consider. Well, no, thank Oops, sorry, I think we've got a bit of feedback there. Sorry about that. Um, thanks so much, Sandra. I think that was a really, really comprehensive breakdown on, on some of the key challenges. And I think particularly important to highlight, you know, some of those more political challenges and, and you know, personal psychology challenges, which obviously manifest in so many different ways. Um, a follow-up question for you is just, you know, in your experience, what concrete actions can city governments take to address some of these challenges? And, and you know, are there any sort of opportunities that this offers as well? Right. So, so again, uh, in order of the challenges that I presented, first and foremost, I think we have a, a growing body of development research that is documenting how we can facilitate the integration of vulnerable or low-income job seekers into uh, thinner labor markets in the developing world. So uh, governments can invest in matching schemes that bring job seekers and employers together. Uh, these could be apprenticeships, these could be internships, job fairs, reskilling initiatives, uh, helping job seekers signal their skills. All of these interventions and these tools are available uh, to municipalities, to governments, and they may improve the matching of migrants to jobs. So, so that would be on the labor market challenge. Um, the second point that I would uh, emphasize is municipalities investing considerably in data gathering capabilities to support the management of cities and face most of these challenges. It's really crucial for governments to have real-time data on population flows, on the location of human settlements, 
on the geographic characteristics of the territory and any inherent environmental vulnerabilities uh, to climate events, because this is really the only way in which governments can then invest in general preparedness and activate support packages whenever they're needed, uh, but also to guarantee that there's a sustainable fiscal base uh, to support infrastructure development and an improvement in living conditions uh, in cities. Um, now, these data could also be used to, to educate and capacitate households on how to prepare for natural disasters. Um, there's some interesting research that was recently conducted by Stefan Liefer in Mozambique showing that um, it's important to have not just information on the level of risk, for instance, uh, that a given community faces, but also to be very concrete on what type of measures and actions these communities can take in order to be prepared to adapt to these events. So it's not just the information on the level of risk, because there could be problems with communicating this uh, to communities. There could be issues with not perceiving the right authority from governments, but it's really important to have concrete instructions on how uh, communities can better adapt to these climate events. In terms of the problem of social cohesion that I alluded to earlier, it would be important to think about strategies that support both the migrants and the low-income host communities. Um, and there's another study that we conducted in northern Mozambique where we found that supporting both refugees and hosts in this particular setting through cash transfers and coaching support uh, for employment, that, that significantly reduced the level of animosity between migrants and locals. Um, employment opportunities also generated more interactions and consequently more trust. So there, there are also some tools at the disposal of governments to try to uh, mitigate this challenge of social cohesion. So I think overall, um, this type of population growth in cities can indeed lead to economic growth and development, um, provided that the cities are prepared to leverage uh, this population growth correctly. So. Essentially, what is, what is good for the migrants will be good for development in the long run uh, of these cities. And so I think this is a, an important opportunity for us to end up on the other side with more productive and better managed cities overall. Great. Thanks so much, Sandra. And I think that's a great, great um, point to end on, on, you know, what's good for migrants is what's good for the city. And I think it ties back to what you said in the beginning about um, this sort of process of rural to urban migration is, you know, not necessarily a negative thing. It does come with with a number of, of opportunities for development as well. Um, so I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Yakama um, and maybe just to pick up a little bit on, on what Sandra's already spoken about, about public service delivery um, and what your experience has been on that in Sierra Leone um, as climate change accelerates this migration. Uh, what has happened in terms of delivering adequate public services um, and how, how do we have to think differently about uh, delivering these services with a focus on resilience to the impacts of climate change? Hi everyone, hi Victoria, thank you for having me. Um, as Sandra said, um, urbanization has been a problem for us in Sierra Leone and the thing about Sierra Leone is that the pace at which the, the city is growing really fast by 2020, we expect the population to double and the pace of growth is not, it's, it has been fragmented. Not all areas are going at the same pace and most of the growth, around 38% of it is around in high risk areas. So a lot of slums and informal settlements and it's not been structural. It's not been guided by proper planning. So it's a situation of where it's not about you build it, they will come. It's like they're here and you need to build it. And so the pressure on service delivery has been really high, especially for water supply, sanitation, energy, waste management, road networks, and also even access to schools and hospitals. And the problem is because the migrants need to find ways to have to make to gain access to these services, some of the in interventions that are work they do to enhance their livelihoods also exacerbate the problems. So um, they tend to try to get access to land in high risk areas and then building waterways that's further um, increasing risk of flooding and also um, soil erosion. They trying to get access to energy. So you have um, energy theft, electricity theft that's affecting um, domestic um, revenues. They are also looking at other forms of livelihoods like burning down trees to sell, get charcoal that they could sell. So 
all of that is increasing disaster um, risk. So for the municipality and for the government, because um, there are lots of issues around um, the strength of institutions, also issues around domestic revenue mobilization. So there's, a, there's always a constant battle on how to allocate resources and direct these resources to um, deal with these problems that have resulted from rapid um, organization. And I can say it has been challenging. There's still the grit there to address the challenges, but just having the city growing at a pace that's quite faster than how the resources are going, how the policy landscape is evolving is just a lot of work and we we'll continue to struggle with that. Great, yeah, I think it's a really important point about the fact that people are already there. Um, and, you know, how do we, um, how are we really thinking about providing for people that have already settled perhaps in sort of areas that are, you know, quite difficult to, um, to accommodate people and because they they're already at risk um following on from that what what do you think are the sort of opportunities for change in the coming decade do you think there are areas that we could be sort of working on more and and maybe linked to that do you think we we already know what we need to do or do you think there's still sort of gaps in in our knowledge and you know where we need to get to well, I wouldn't say we already know exactly everything that we need to know. There are still gaps, but there are also um, quite a lot of opportunities that we can look forward to and we can start leveraging now. And one of the things when I always try to talk about leveraging these opportunities, it's, wide, it's widely known that the poorest countries suffer the most um, 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 risk from climate change. They're not like the main um, generators of um, all these greenhouse gases, they are at um, the most risk. So when we're designing solutions to help them in terms of mitigation or um, adaptation, we should keep that in mind because a lot of these countries often lack the means to design and implement these programs that they need for adaptation. And in terms of um, getting the resources together that we need for adaptation, sometimes there are a lot of challenges around getting the right data to inform some of this decision making. So there's lots of opportunities in how we can better leverage research and development, building data systems and strengthening institutions. And when we looking at opportunities for strengthening institutions around policy reforms, capacity to improve domestic revenue mobilization, looking at how we can have clarity of rules, especially in terms of urban planning, which between central government and local government, and also how we can also mainstream education and climate and education into our learning systems, because then we need to have positive behavioral change to make some of these um, responses or interventions more sustainable and can transcend generations. And of course, um, when we talk about policies, we need to, we can't actually measure how well a country is doing in terms of adaptation, but if we have the right research and the right data and the right institutions that go into the policy design, then we can have well-crafted innovative policies with um, institutions that can lead effective implementation that will be guaranteed to um, say we can get the impacts that we want to. And some of the things I also think we should think about seriously is that if we don't have the resources to implement all these well thought through policies, all of these conversations that we have will just be like storytelling. And for these countries, a lot of them are developing countries and they have great um, potential to develop um, their own domestic revenue mobilization but then they also depend a lot on development partners and we're trying to see how private sector can also complement government efforts so we're looking to see how we can work with them to make sure that um, climate adaptation is mainstream into the macro fiscal policy um, decision making and also how private sector and other investments can be more environmental and social and governance um, compliant because um, if there's an imbalance between what the public sector is doing and what the private sector is doing, then we cannot say there's a comprehensive or systematic approach to these is issues. So we'll be like taking two steps forward and then five steps backwards. And the thing is, when we estimate the amount of resources that the world needs to 
address issues around adaptation mitigation it's in billions because um it's some research that the IMF did is like about 1% of GDP is needed in low income countries and those countries that like in the Pacific or in coastal areas if we need more resources so if we don't kind of put the financing um, discussion in the center, then we are not actually addressing some of the issues that we need. Great. I, I really like the point you made about uh, if we don't have all the resources, it's just storytelling, because I think that's a really important point. We can you know, talk about all these things that we need to do, um, investing in getting the right information. But if we don't have the resources to deliver that, um, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. And I think it links to the point that you made earlier around um, the need for implementation, you know, in a lot of cases, we do do know what we need to do, but we've known that for a long time and it, it's been very difficult to implement it for a number of other reasons. So maybe a point to come back to um, later in the discussions. Um, thanks very much, Yakama. I'm going to move to uh, Dr. Omar Masood now and um, talk about primarily around the fact that Pakistan uh, has been facing the consequences of one of the worst uh, flooding in the country's recorded history. Um, so the information I have at the moment is that about one third of the country um, was underwater, um, according to analysis from satellite imagery, with more than 33 million people affected. And scientists have linked this to heavy monsoon rains and unusually high glacial melt, which is obviously caused by global warming. Um, so, uh, Omar, I'd love to ask you what investments and coordination effects do you think are needed to prepare developing cities for the occurrence of more frequent extreme weather events such as these floods? Uh, thank you, Victoria, for having me uh, once again, uh, IGC and LSE. Uh, Victoria, as you are aware, I tend to ramble on, so please uh, cut me off when my time is up because I, I have a tendency to just uh, go on speaking. But you're uh, coming to the question that you are uh, asking. Uh, you know, this is a very relevant question, and I have some uh, very honest responses to it. Uh, number one, when you talk about investment and our investment preferences, uh, to be very honest, climate change is not linked to how we invest. Uh, somehow that linkage between uh, climate change uh, climate change and investments is simply not there. We, we, we look at social rate of return and we look at financial rate of returns and we look at how, how, how much of a population is affected by a particular infrastructure or other investment projects. But taking into account the effect or taking into account or looking at a project in a category as a climate resilient project that simply does not exist. So we, we lack those categorizations through which we can actually have a filtering process to select or to divert our resources for these type of projects. So, you know, as, as the speaker just before me uh, pointed out, it just becomes very anecdotal. It becomes very uh, storytelling like because there is really not a, a structure uh, at the project or the program level, which is looking at projects and looking at their climate change mitigating effects. And, you know, that is one of the reason that, that you know, uh, despite the floods and despite everything, uh, we, we just could not cope with it. Let me remind you uh, that on the 26th of June, uh, the uh, Ministry of Climate Change had a meeting, all four provinces included. None of the cities were invited because local governments are considered beneath it. So, you know, that is one big, uh, you know, one big challenge. So climate change is sometimes either a national priority or it becomes a provincial priority, but it is yet to become a local priority. I think that type of an integration in any country is, is a must. Uh, that meeting was on drought. On 24th of June, we were discussing drought. We had three months of no rainfall, and the very area which were totally bone dry are the very areas which are drenched in 10 feet of water, even as we speak. So uh, the meteor meteorological office at that time reported that in August, we are going to have above average rainfall. That was the prediction on which everything was based. So, you know, 
uh, the science and policy interface also needs to be developed a lot. When you are talking about climate change events and climate change events which are of an extreme nature, I think uh, we just do not have that sensitivity yet in the government to understand what is the meaning of above average rainfall? Is it a bureaucratic speak for an extreme event or it is actually statistically what we call above average rainfall? In the end, the province of Sin, the most affected, received four times its average rainfall. So that is not above average, that is extreme. And um, as far as my information is concerned, none of the models actually predicted that much uh, extreme rainfall. And in fact, the damage which occurred or the loss which occurred was due to the extreme rainfall and the river floods followed later. So, uh, so it was a double whammy as you speak. So it was extreme rainfall and then immediately within three or four days, the rivers flooded. So the areas which had to absorb the overflow of the river was already flooded. So there was super flooding. And, and, the, and the images which you see worldwide is basically a combination of river floods and extreme rainfall. Pakistan conventionally has been very well prepared for river flooding. Uh, our past floods have been actually river floods. But, you know, this flooding, uh, the, uh, the biggest culprit was actually an extreme uh, weather event, which was uh, a rainfall in the southern parts of the country. And then another thing, looking at the topography, this is something that we never envisaged. Uh, in hilly areas, uh, when uh, uh, rainfall or intense rainfall occurs, flash, for flash flooding is a phenomenon which is very difficult to deal. Even the, settle even the satellite pictures are unable to capture the extent of flash flooding because it happens very quickly and it destroys very quickly. And within 24 hours, the area is ravaged, but it's dry. The, the, the water has flowed past it. And it's dry, you know, just to give you an example, because statistics over here are really meaningful. Uh, a hill torrent in, in the southern part of Punjab uh, was flowing at 250,000 cusic feet of water per second. And that flowed into the Indus River. And the momentum of that torrent was so high that the river stopped. So the gauge upstream actually started rising. The, rivets, the river actually started flooding upstream because that torrent, the, uh, the, uh, the speed of the torrent and the momentum of the torrent was so strong that it, it actually stopped a uh, river. And when it went into the southern part of the country, it went in very fast and very hard. So we had an event which was unpredictable, but at the same time, we also recognized the fact that you know these sounds and these noises were already being made six months ago and a year ago that we are going to face an extreme weather event. But as far as our investments, uh, uh, as far as our investment frameworks are concerned, or our decision frameworks are concerned, climate-induced weather events, or what policies or projects that we need to put in place that look at these things or that are analyzed in that lens is simply absent. And I think that is one of the reasons that you have seen the destruction that you have seen. Otherwise, you know, uh, there is fair warning of this thing. And if, if the policymakers at that time had the structures and the frameworks and the interfaces in place, they would have been able to act well. So when the river flood occurred, the entire government was geared up. The boats were in place, uh, the embankments were solid, the irrigation uh, you know, structures were safe. So there we, we earned full marks, but it was the rain, this extreme event for which we were not prepared because we are not really prepared for uh, you know, climate induced you know, emergencies. Uh, a few other points that, that, uh, you know, that I want to make and, and, and these have been made is about data. Did we have the information? Or did we have enough information to forecast such a thing is going to happen in the, new, uh, in the near future? Yes, we did. And we still have that information. The challenge is, uh, the challenge is with all climate related information is that uh, it needs to be updated. It needs to be standardized. It needs to be shared and it need, needs to be mainstream at the right forum. 
So this is the biggest challenge. I might have the right information. I might have the climate model here in the urban unit, but that climate model and that information needs to be standardized across different levels of agencies and government. So they are able to understand what this information means and then they are sensitive enough to actually update this information. So when it comes to relief and rehabilitation and forecasting future events, we have a much more sort of a responsive data system or a data infrastructure in place, which is missing. So we have data, but we don't have a data infrastructure as far as this thing is concerned. And I think this is one low hanging fruit which the urban unit has been constantly advising the government that we can really work very quickly on it. There's no need to actually reinvent the wheel. Uh, one more thing, uh, now I will turn to the cities and, uh, and this issue of cities and climate change and especially flooding. Uh, the city governments are facing difficulty in conceiving and understanding climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, you know, how to make them realize that their in infrastructure and investment decisions have to be climate resilient. I think there is a lot of need for that type of capacity building. If I would not even call it capacity building, but sensitization that certain infrastructure can be actually climate resilient or can be designed to be actually climate you know, resilient. Uh, there is my impact of climate related policies. And I would urge for a new organiz organizational design and institutional design against conventional city bureaucracies. Because for example, the city of Lahore does not have any section or head or any cell which is looking at heavy monsoon rains as a, as a possible event which can actually occur in Lahore. We are predicting that this thing can actually occur. It was even predicted for the month of August we just escaped it. It happened 40 miles away from us. Uh, so uh, then there is obviously the need for collaboration between different levels of government. So um, giving the example of my own country, there is the federal government, then there are the provinces, and then there, the, then there are the local and the cities, uh, like the city's government. One thing about rural to urban migration. Now, you know, this is a really interesting area. Uh, I'm talking about physical rural to urban you know, migration. What happens is that when, a lot, uh, when migration take place, especially in cities like Lahore or big cities, and that is going to take place, especially in the city of Karachi, because Karachi is proximal to the area which has been most devastated because the farmers over there have lost not only this season of crops, but they are likely to lose, uh, lose the next season of cropping. So obviously there would be migration from those areas to the cities of Karachi and Hyderabad. Over there, the issue is really of land use. And when slums develop, when peri-urban areas actually develop, limited land which is required for urban use, the price of that land goes up. When the price of that land goes up, Another phenomenon occurs. Any type of resilient infrastructure investment that we intend to make becomes very expensive because the land price has become very expensive. For example, in Lahore, because of rural to urban migration, because of population growth in the city, we just do not have landfill for, uh, we, we, we just do not have land for an, another landfill site. For the last six months, we are searching for another landfill site because our landfill site is now full. And there is no private land and there is no state land which is affordable. Similarly, uh, simil uh, same things are happening with water treatment plants. A water treatment plant needs a specific number, uh, um, an area on which it, uh, which it can be actually set up. I can give you an example on the, of an Asian Development Bank project, which is a very slow moving project. And the biggest bottleneck was that the land for the water treatment plant was not easily available. The title clearances, the resettlement and everything. So, you know, this is a dynamic within a dynamic. So, you know, rural to urban migration is taking place. We are talking about resilient infrastructure and how cities can cope with it. But we, we, we need to also remind ourselves that everything is happening in a physical space. And the availability of physical space 
is also bec becoming more and more limited. So we really need, and I would urge through this forum, creative and out of box thinking for these challenges. Can we have a smaller land area requirement for a water treatment plant? Can the landfill site be replaced for, by recycling facilities? Even recycling facilities would need land. Would that land be sufficient enough for a recycling facility? So when you sort of try to unravel and try to unravel a problem, you will run into another roadblock and then into another roadblock. So this really needs a deep, complicated thinking. You know, I think there in, in organizational science, it's called like a wicked problem. So, you know, this is, this is really hard. And as uh, Sandra said uh, right at the start, the pace and the scale is not making things easier. It's like trying to jump onto a moving train. And if you miss that timing, you are going to be splattered against the train like it, like it happens in the movies. So, you know, uh, you know, with that sort of a melodramatic, uh, you know, end to my, you know, conversation, I end here and I, I look forward for the questions and more discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Masood. And I think you, um, you answered my follow up question as well, which was very much linked to the question of data and, you know, the kind of data that you as the urban unit collect and how that can feed into um, decision making. And I think that's, you know, that's a really important takeaway that in a lot of cases, we do have the information, but we don't have the infrastructure um, to get that information to the people making those decisions, and how, how we think a little bit better about that. Um, I think the point you made also about, um, you know, infrastructure and and land use and space is a really important one as well, because I think a lot of the discussions we've been having um, internally around this revolve around how, you know, just investing in the basics and the usual sort of infrastructure and services in cities is in a way, you know, preparing for adaptation and um, increasing resilience and sustainability of cities. But we also need to be thinking about how we can innovate this and, and do it a lot better in the future. Um, so I'm going to uh, now head over to uh, Gary Bryan and um, maybe pick up, I think um, Omar alluded to this in some ways around sort of how in Pakistan there's been you know, preparedness to some of these uh, crises events that happen at, on a more regular basis, um, but not so much in the sense of these these huge sort of uh, shark disasters, which are becoming more and more the norm, even though it's not historically been the case. Um, so I wanted to ask you, based on your research on, on internal migration in Bangladesh and Indonesia, could you explain the dynamics behind this sort of seasonal migration and, and what it tells us about urban op opportunity? Uh, thank you, Vicky, for the question. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you particularly to Omar and Yakima for uh, your amazing uh, observations. Uh, super interesting. And also Sandra. Um, so I'm going to kind of half answer your question and do some other things that I want to do anyway. Um, so I, I think I want to just first pick up on where Sandra started, but also that's come up uh, several times, which is I think that if I read about climate change in the media, they will, it will list the negatives that are coming our way. Reduced agricultural productivity, flooding, et cetera, et cetera. And on that list is always going to be displacement and migration. And by placing that on that list, we're inherently saying that that movement of people is, is bad. But I think we do need to move beyond that view of this as displacement to a view that this is migration and this will be migration that can create development. We know that perhaps from some of my own work, but a lot of people's work that if people move into cities in a ordered and prepared way, they take advantage of the productivity gains of being in cities and they become better off. We also know that cities are a place where migrants can create adaptation. So, sorry, <laughs> where, where migrants can adapt. So by moving out of a rural area into a city where that city is further away from the harms of the coasts or further away from agricultural areas which are no longer uh, as productive, that creates adaptation for these people. So they both develop and they adapt through this migration. But finally, this sort of movement into a city also creates 
mitigation. We know that densely populated cities are places where eventually we will have lower emissions, fewer people driving around, uh, masses of people together where we can cool apartment buildings rather than individual homes, etc. So in the long run, this seems like what we want to see as a positive. So I think we want to move past that displacement idea and towards migration for development, adaptation and mitigation and see this as a positive. Now, of course, it, as everyone has said, when that migration occurs, it can be handled extremely badly. And the worst outcome, of course, here is that you have large numbers of people flowing into cities and across borders, and that creates conflict. And I think that if we're honest with ourselves about what we think are the real dangers of climate change, it is that conflict created by migration that is what we really think is going to be the human problem here. So if we look, for example, at Dave Donaldson's estimates of what are going to be the GDP impacts of climate change, we see a perhaps 6% reduction in the GDP created by agriculture. If we assume that manufacturing is not heavily affected, that's not a massive shock, but it would require massive movements of people and industry and agriculture across space. So we think there's going to be massive costs. That's where it's going to happen. So then we have an opportunity and we have a massive threat. And it comes down to us trying to understand what do we do in response to this? And I want to sort of sort of talk about what we as the IGC and people associated with the IGC can do. And our bread and butter is to try to say, how can we very well understand what specific actions are going to work to try and mitigate this? And I think I want to pick up on something that Vicky said earlier when she said, well, do we know what to do already? And I think I want to say, no, we don't. And we never do. Because even if we think there's some strategy we would like to see happening, if it's not happening, we must ask, why isn't it happening? So we move one layer back. And instead of thinking about why aren't we building roads, we think, why is our governance so bad that we don't build the roads that are obvious to build? And so, for example, in Omar's fantastic comment about sensitizing government officials in cities to the idea that their infrastructure is going to need to be built in a way that's climate resilient in the future. This is a question that the IGC can answer. We can try to understand whether just a simple sensitization is going to lead to a change in the way that policymakers and government officials do think about the issue or whether that sensitization doesn't work. And we need to do something much more robust at the institutional level to force people to take this into account. We can do this sort of research around uh, many different areas. Why don't we have the frameworks that Omar was talking about for looking at data and being prepared for these sorts of things? What sort of inter interventions actually create those, uh, those frameworks and make them work? We can even start thinking about some of uh, Omar's wicked problems. I think you know, the all land use question is a great one for economists. We have a large theoretical literature which tries to understand how we should go about acquiring land when it's fragmented and owned by many landholders and bringing it in and building higher density buildings. We can try to sit and work on the research that would allow that to happen. And that sort of work that I'm talking about here takes advantage of the comparative advantage of the IGC, which is free academics who understand some of these issues, but can go out and create a bespoke answer in a specific center to a question that's difficult. Now, in general, we're not going to be able to answer every question this way, but we can answer many questions. Um, I sort of also want to add here that this problem, as Omar sort of commented, is so large that we can't afford to put in place policies that don't work. So perhaps to pick on Omar again, if we if we think that sensitization of government officials is the way to go and we do that without knowing whether it works, we may miss the opportunity to make the changes we need. So we need to be constantly testing and working out whether the policies that we put in place work. OK, so now let me give so to answer more for this specific question, I'll talk a little bit about um, about migration in response to shocks and some work that I did some time ago in Bangladesh. And maybe it's a decent example of the sorts of work that we really can do where IGC academics can create work that has, I hope, some value. 
So the setting we're looking at is northwestern Bangladesh, the Rangpur area of Bangladesh. And this is an area that faces a, a ongoing shocks of a very specific kind. So what happens is you have a, a, planting, a, a, a planting season, the crop grows, there's a harvest. And if that harvest isn't a great harvest, then the food is all consumed and you have the next planting season. And now you have a time when the, there's, the crop is in the ground, there's no labor work for landless individuals, but at the same time, the food is starting to run out, so food prices are increasing. This is what's called a lean season. These are common across the world. And all of a sudden you have landless laborers who every year predictably in this season go hungry and there are deaths. So this is the sort of thing, it's one example of a shock that we think should, we will think will be more common with climate change. There'll be more bad seasons. It's not the same sort of shock as Omar is talking about, about massive flooding. So it's not, not going to talk to that. And so uh, we're interested in what happens and what people do in response to this. And the answer is that some proportion of households send someone into the city at this time of year if there's a bad season. And what's going on there is you're taking advantage of the fact that the city is much more stable in its wage rate. A relatively large number of people can flood from northwestern Bangladesh into Dhaka and find reasonable levels of work. In our data, what they're doing is doing fairly low level jobs. They're working on some construction sites. They're working as rickshaw drivers, etc. There'll be some compression of the wage at this time of year, but there might also be sectors that try to seasonally adjust when they're using labor to take advantage of this pool of labor. Um, so that's what's going on. And our simple experiment was to try to understand whether uh, households are taking enough advantage of this or whether some constraints mean they don't. And we give a very small amount of money in a randomized control trial to a group of, of, of people in this situation. And we find that that very small amount of money encourages them to migrate into the city. And it is, in our data, very good for them. They do very well out of it. Um, so what can we learn about cities here? Well, we can learn that cities being this st stable is a wonderful way of helping people who are in shock adapted ways to um, to cope with their shocks. And so we need to continue to build the ability of the city to, to keep that sort of stable wage rate in the long run. How do we do that? Well, that's another research question. Um, it's also the case that we discovered there's a wonderful paper recently, fairly recent, about building bridges in Nicaragua that addresses a similar question. You have uh, rural areas that are cut off from cities by floodplains. Building a bridge over that floodplain means you get access to that city. And what they see in that paper, which goes a little bit beyond what we were able to see, is actually that increases productivity in the rural area because this sort of insurance from the city enables people to have the money and take the risk and have the investments in their in their rural areas. Um, so then we do need to 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 maintain that that requirement. And, and, and that's the same things that everyone else has said. We need to know, as Sandra points out, how to help people find jobs, etc. Now we do a little bit of a replication of this experiment in Indonesia very recently. And in that setting, what we did was we tried, we sort of increased the amount of money we were sending people. And what we see there is that people who are, when we give people a small amount of money, we see the same thing. They move into the cities and they do well. When we give them a lot of money, then we get more and more marginal migrants until eventually people are moving and actually reducing their incomes. So that does tend to suggest that the number of people who can make use of this particular technology in order to smooth their shocks is is limited. It's a small proportion. Now, a couple of comments around that. One possibility here is that just means that some people in rural communities are not well uh, skilled to deal with, with working in the city. The other is it's plausible that what we really need is to be thinking about how to train rural workers to integrate into urban labor markets. So I think this is an area where we should be spending a lot of time. We know that climate change is going to affect people. We sort of, to some extent, know where those people are currently living. 
We know they're going to adapt by moving either seasonally or permanently into the city. It is now that we should be thinking about how to go about training people. So in combination with Robin Burgess, Stefano Correa and some others and BRAC, we are trying at the moment in Bangladesh to design a program that looks like this, that takes the sort of rural training programs that we've seen a lot of evidence on and says, well, what if instead of training you how to, how to raise a cow, we think about training you to be someone who can work in a slightly more productive job in the city than just being a rickshaw driver that gives you those urban skills and helps you adapt in that in that setting. Um, so that's an overview of my work. But what I really do want to push here is that each of these cases that I'm talking about, the experiment in Bangladesh around seasonal migration, the experiment in Indonesia about who benefits from seasonal migration, and this potential uh, experiment in, in Bangladesh with BRAC, these are all examples where we're working in concert with an NGO or with government to answer a question that is in very important, but through a very clear research strategy where uh, the IGC academics are contributing our skills to answer a question that government wants to know the answer to and where getting the answer wrong is going to be very problematic. So I want to sort of suggest that this is the way that IGC can best go about contributing uh, to these debates. So thank you for the question, Vicky. Cheers. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Garrett. No, I think useful reflection on on where we do things and and where we need to get very more, much more specific about you know the bigger picture things we know we need to do but the constraints that we need to overcome to get there um i've got a quick follow-up question and then i'm gonna go to the the sort of broad debate but i think uh, one interesting thing about what you've spoken about is is this sort of flow of people between uh rural and urban settings to sort of I guess, uh, smooth their stability and and be able to adapt. Um, what do you think is the sort of impact then on uh, policy at the city level to manage that flow with having sort of, you know, a larger, larger population at some times of the year and a smaller population at others? So I think in the very long run, I don't see any reason why a city that sees a slow increase in the number of seasonal migrants wouldn't relatively well adapt by itself. So essentially, let's think about work. If you are an employer and you have a long time to study the labor market and you see seasonal drops in wages, then sure, you adapt things so that you have a lot of labor uh, demand at that time of year. I think there's also something to be said around homes you, plausibly you see an influx of people and slowly landlords start to think about how they can accommodate those people or people start to rent out spare rooms etc and certainly that's how most people are staying they're not renting their own houses they're sitting in a room of a friend or a family or member or like that so in the long run i think it would adapt i think that, that, that as with much of climate change the thing we have to be worried about is this is coming more quickly than markets are going to adapt to these kinds of things. So I think we have to do think about what are reasonable ways of trying to encourage firms to sort of do something that uses labor during these time periods. What is the way we can think about housing in a way that encourages these rooms to become available? There's obvious things that where we can do IGC type work on matching migrant workers to homes. It's Airbnb for migrant workers into cities. There's got to be something we can practically do and evaluate and help to design. That's sort of in line with what Sandra was talking about, matching kind of, of, of laborers to jobs. We can do that for laborers to housing. And that's sort of, you know, if you think about Airbnb, that's double benefits. The migrant benefits by having a home and the person who has the home benefits by renting it out in some time period. So those are the sorts of things I think we should be doing with the emphasis on saying, look, practically, can we design these things? Can we get somebody who's in government who wants to experiment with it? And can we work out whether these things work to smooth, uh, to smooth people's migration experience? Great. I'm going to go now just to open up the discussion a little bit more and I would like to um, remind the uh, audience um, if you do have any questions that you would like to ask, please do pop them into the Q&A and we'll be coming to that through this next um, phase of discussion. Um, 
Um, but just in giving sort of a chance for, for all the panelists to respond to, to the inputs we've heard about sort of data and infrastructure and information and revenue mobilization and, and particularly about the sort of narrative of uh, migration, um, you know, not as this sort of phenomenon that's really putting pressure on cities, but how we can view it as this opportunity as well. Um, so maybe in the broad framing of, of what you all think the sort of developing city of 2050 should look like, if we can have a, you know, uh, a bit of a, a, a dream on, on what these things could be. Um, I'd like to first uh, turn to Yakama just to get your sort of reflections on the discussion today and, and what you see as the sort of future cities um, uh, in an ideal world. Um, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, everyone. So based on what everyone has said, definitely future cities will be cities are better. And when I think about uh, 2050, I offer the first picture that comes to mind is what you see in the sci-fi movies. Everything's clean, everyone's wearing white, glass buildings everywhere, flying cars. So I think that's possible. It's not just like movie kind of stuff. So definitely, um, when we think about cities, and we've been talking about um, urbanization, migration, and we know that the world is growing and the population is set to explode, say by um, 9.8 billion in by 2050, and 70% of that would be living in cities. So definitely, we need to think more current, currently about how we design these future cities. And um, I do read a lot about future cities, and. I tend to be partial towards what like the architects and design firms put out there. And I want to just share one, one, um, one approach that um, Skidmore, Howling and Merrick put out across like 10 different pillars looking at how the ecology should be like, what water sh um, systems would be like, energy systems, waste system, waste management systems, the food we'll be eating, mobility issues, culture, infrastructure, and the economy. And this covers not just buildings, but the entire ecosystem in which the city will live and operate. So in terms of ecology, definitely future cities would be built around um, protecting the habitat and the natural resources that are present. In terms of energy, energy should be like 100% renewable, mobility, most of the services would be um, around um, in working distance. So there's certain cities that are like planning to be like five minute cities. So all the facilities, amenities you need, you can walk to work in a certain radius and reach them. And definitely transportation would be using clean energy, hybrid um, and electricity, flying vehicles, that's possible. And also more um, sustainable or more, more um, better public transport networks that will be using low um, fuel emissions. In terms of buildings, a lot of buildings should be more multifunctional. So you have a mix of residents, schools, and education spaces, and um, offices within buildings. And also these buildings will be built in such a way that they can have a lot of green spaces. And some of them should be built in a way that they can be more energy efficient. So, say solar windows, so you generate the energy that you that you will need to use. So that's how I visit the future um, architecture and evolving for future cities. In terms of waste management, of course, we'll see less and less waste go making it to landfills, more of recycling, and also having um, um, projects around waste to energy um, conversions in terms of food, having plans for not only growing the food, but distribution, but also um, um, disposal and reducing um, disposal and also making transforming some of waste foods into other products like fertilizer and stuff like that. And for humans, we don't live in a vacuum. A lot of us have different cities, have different histories, different traditions. So future cities definitely will be built around leveraging or preserving some of the cultural dynamics that makes us unique as um, human beings. So definitely that will be there. And the thing around all of this is that this is just to be livable. You should be able to survive, you should be able to reach your fullest potentials in these cities. But of course, we're all diverse human beings. All of these cities, our current cities, do have different baselines to start off from and how um, the work towards reducing the impact of climate change is progressing. So as we look at this, definitely the end 2050, 
um, London in 2050 will definitely look different from um, Freetown in 2050. But the thing is, there's the diversity and all of this country leverage in technology and continuous research and development. So, and also we'll be leveraging emerging opportunities because we, as now, we don't know exactly everything that we need to know. So research is going to go on. So all those emerging opportunities from future research is something that will continue to leverage. And I strongly believe in the power of the human mind. So I imagine future cities will just be awesome. I like that. It's such a, a positive picture of, of years to come. I think, yeah, particularly on renewable energy, thinking about urban mobility in very sort of new and innovative ways. Um, waste management, obviously, a really important one. But I think um, particularly what you said about sort of preserving cultural dynamics and, and just thinking about the people in the city as well is really, really important. Um, I'm going to pose the same question to you, Sandra, and also um, if you want to sort of pick up on any of the previous points made, that would be wonderful as well. Sure. Thanks, Vicky. Um, I would probably, well, I would second everything that Yakama has just said, and uh, I would pick on what is perhaps the, the common denominator across all these interventions, uh, just to re-emphasize the need for, for data, for improved planning and adaptation to what essentially will continue to be a changing landscape. And, and this is not just about uh, the Ministry of Planning having updated information to design early warning systems uh, or disaster preparedness that is actionable, like Omar uh, was mentioning earlier. It is also having all the data that are needed to run these rapidly growing cities efficiently. It is really how to turn a migration into an opportunity as opposed to a challenge, as Garrett was mentioning earlier, uh, and to respond to the challenge that Yakama just correctly pointed out, which is they are here, how do we build for them in the context of this urban migration? So uh, perhaps this is very colored by my experience in Mozambique, and there's going to be a lot of variance across different countries, but it is often the case that the Ministry of Health has no information on patient flows, on overcrowding in clinics, on the placement of different health providers. The ministries of education have no information on enrollment rates, on students' achievement. Um, ministries of housing have limited information on informal settlements in cities and what their living conditions really are. Municipalities have uh, very poor cadastral systems so that land taxes often go uncollected. So, so really what we need uh, is this ability for the city, city of the future to have all the required data and keep it up to date, uh, which is already a key challenge for proper policy design and implementation in normal times. But in times of unprecedented pressure on urban areas, I think these shortcomings are going to be even more acutely felt. So uh, we need to understand how can we develop these data gathering, data processing, but also data interpretation capabilities uh, to have better managed cities and, and countries in the developing world in the, in the future. Great, thanks so much, Sandra. And I think that's a great segue to, to Omar. Um, Omar, same question to you, but maybe picking up on that, that point about data and, and what the urban unit is, is currently doing in that regard. Uh, well, I think, uh, uh, you know, there are so many important points that have been made uh, since I stopped speaking. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I need to uh, have a bit of reflection on what Gerrit said about uh, migration. Uh, in my understanding, when I said about it, I'm not talking ab about an exodus to the cities from the rural areas. I'm talking about well thought through deliberated migration which takes place across a generation. Uh, so let me introduce myself. I'm a very senior civil servant. So I get a government issued Honda car for me, which is waiting for me when I'm going to finish this uh, seminar, I'm going to be driven home. But the person who is going to drive me home, my driver, uh, belongs to uh, uh, to the city of Saival, which is total farmland. It's about 100 miles from here. And he came to the city of Lahore in 1991. And he came here as, uh, uh, as a bulldozer driver on a construction site because he knew how to operate a tractor in the farm 
he could do the rough work of also a you know, bulldozer driver. So, you know, if you, uh, if you share a car with a person for two years, you, you get to know him very intimately. So, you know, there is a set of equations in their mind in which they are balancing their urban and their rural setting. So he has got some land in that, in, uh, to the area which he belongs, which he cultivates or somebody cultivates for him. So he's, get, he's getting some income from there. Then he's getting some income here from the city, from the company in which I work. And he is actually uh, living in a place which he, in which, uh, where he is giving his rent in kind. So he's not paying rent. He, so he's doing, uh, uh, after, after office hours, he's uh, a driver for a family who has offered him uh, living quarters in their residence. Such examples run into millions in the province of Punjab. And these people have been living, for example, this particular person has been living in the city for the last 30 years almost now. And they are well adjusted right now because of the peculiar economic situation in Pakistan. The equations are a bit imbalanced in his mind and he keeps talking about returning back to his farm and because cost of living in the city has become very expensive. So, you know, uh, this deliberated rural to urban migration, which is the long-term migration, you know, that is something we need to do some sort of a cohort analysis of this because how people are thinking uh, into moving into cities is something very different. So he moved in 91 because he knew how to operate a tractor or how to operate heavy machinery. Right now, across the road from this building, I'm sitting in the center of the city of Lahore. There is a women's hostel, the one which, uh, you know, Garrett is talking about, like a B and b So there are actually females coming from other cities and other areas, even rural areas for employment in Lahore. I'm not talking even about males, I'm talking about females. So there is a service industry in this very big city, and that service industry uh, f uh, feels that it can get a better wage or can get cheaper labor from outside Lahore, from the cities of Gujrawala, Narawal, which are like 40, 50, 60, 100 miles away from here. And these people are staying in these hostels. There is, I mean, if you go into the old core of the city of Lahore, uh, the central business district has moved away, but the old central business district, which is in a process of, a process of regeneration, you have men's hostels, women's hostels, then again, men's hostels. So there is a lot of population coming from outside, sorry. A lot of population coming from outside, which is settling in the city and the city is adapting to it naturally. What all we did need to do is to get the data on this, because as Sandra said, population flow is something which can tell you how your infrastructure and service delivery can cope with it. If it is coping so well, say it's an X percentage of the horse population and you can tell it. And I can, I can give you a stark example of that. When COVID happened and the first lockdown happened, the city sort of like disappeared. It's not that everybody went inside and nobody came out from their homes. It's basically that the migrants went back to the rural areas. This is exactly what happened with, you know, with COVID. Obviously, they could not uh, keep on living over there because their wages were sort of, uh, because of the lockdown, there were no wages. And that's why they migrated back to the rural area. And within a week, Lahore became a very open city. There was no congestion, nothing else. But even now, with all the migrants back, Lahore is kind of coping. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, not, saying, I'm not saying that it is coping well. There is a lot of pollution, service service like a delivery is not of the standard, but this is being done without any government plan or framework in place on how to do, uh, deal with rural to urban migration. So let's take our you know, hats off to these cities and how they fix their problems in a very organic and natural way. And as researchers and as policy makers, before we go to the drawing board, let's take a few steps back and let's say, how are these cities working so far, and what is what is the, what is it that is making it tick? And I, I, you know, I believe that these abandoned centers of the cities, these these areas which we call 
prime for regeneration. I think we really need to start seriously thinking about it, that these areas should not be like commercial hubs, but they can actually become, you know, um, um, sort of a place where this rural to urban migration can actually adjust itself. And uh, I think in our master planning also, or in our planning for cities, that's one element we keep on missing. Your question about the future of the cities, well, every, every person in this forum is going to talk about the future of, of the city from their particular context. Here, when I sit here in the province of Punjab, I'm sitting in the city of Lahore, uh, but uh, uh, because I cannot share the visual with you, but if you were to look at the province of Punjab, uh, it is a vast uh, rural area, but it is interspersed by towns and cities of different sizes. So, you know, I might be, uh, be, I might be a heretic over here, but let me bring back the secondary city back, back to the fore. You know, in the 70s, there was a lot of talk about secondary cities and developing secondary cities and all that. But I, you know, I, I really think secondary cities are already being evolved here in the province of Punjab. So, you know, there is the mega city, the big city, the prime city, which is Lahore or Rahul Pindi or Gujrawala. Then there are about like 17 or 18 secondary cities, which have evolved from small towns or rural townships into cities which have got a service infrastructure in which rural and urban migration is taking place even be, you know, between them. And there it is, the farmer comes to work in the city and then in the evening goes back to his farms. Or there's a big household, a member is working in the city, another member is taking care of the farm. So, you know, income smoothing, as we say, is actually already happening under our nose. What we all need to do is to really do a much more detailed analysis or a survey of this demographic, which we usually miss in all types of our planning, whether it's local, national, or provincial. So my vision, about the future of the cities is uh, that we should be enablers. Cities are naturally creative places. They find their own sort of depth where we, you know, wherever they are. But we should be, we should be uh, cognizant of the fact of what is happening around us. And if we are cognizant of that, I think we can make those small little interventions which are not going to break the bank for us, but which can really affect the city in a big way. Like somebody mentioned the bridge. So it's all sometimes that you need is a bridge or, or, or a bypass or a roundabout or something like that, which can totally change these, uh, you know, uh, transform the area within the next 10 to 15 years. And this is already happening, uh, you know, in, in, in Punjab, I can quote you several cases where road infrastructure has actually transformed the rural area into a semi-rural, and it's becoming fast urbanized. You know, all these things, while we, we need to be cognizant of what is happening with the people, we need to be cognizant of what we are doing with the infrastructure. And when we make these decisions about service delivery, I think we really need to have this data sets in, in front of us before we, uh, before we actually make these, you know, decisions. But I am personally, uh, my vision of the future is that these cities are going to absorb, are, are, as far as Punjab is concerned, are in a position to absorb all this rural to urban migration, which, which will happen due to climate change, which will happen to, uh, due to uh, perhaps lower financial returns, or there might be even a reverse of it. So, you know, if agriculture productivity goes up, uh, your return per acre goes up, you might see a reversal of people leaving the city back to the farms and the wage rates over here the city here in the city might uh, like start actually shooting up so we really need to understand the person who's migrating i think we need to understand the person the demographic of that person i think we've not gone deep enough on that we talk of talk of it as a number we don't talk of it as age his or her qualification, his background, what, what he's looking for, what job is he he's actually getting into. And this, this can be done, but then there is another thing 
which is going on and which I need to forewarn all the participants about it. It's the smart city. So, you know, the smart city is another thing, which is another beast, which we, uh, which we are actually dealing or we are trying to tame is, uh, you know, the smart city will give you all the razzle dazzle of uh, what a smart city should be, but it will really not tell you about population flows or, or things like that. Um, yes, yes, if you have a good friend at a telecommunication company, they can use the mobile phones and they can easily tell you what is the population flow out of Lahore uh, in and out every day in terms of migrants and everything, because sometimes mobile, fire, mobile phones are actually registered to, this, uh, to the city or the place of your origin. And if it is being used in Lahore, it's possibly the guy is a migrant or the person is a migrant. But, you know, I believe uh, the future of the cities is uh, I'm very op optimistic about it, but I think we are, will be failing to do our homework if we do not understand the citizens of these cities. And I think we are looking at the citizens in a very, very generalized fashion because citizens come from all over the places into the city. And I think that is something that really needs to be recognized. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I think a, a good note to end on with uh, the sort of cautioning against uh, smart cities and what they can and can't do for us. Um, Garrett, uh, turning to you, we, we're left with sort of six minutes left. Um, so you're gonna have to, to make a bit of a speedy intervention at the end. And, and I'm gonna make it more difficult by um, posing the, sort of, the question we've got from uh, Shanaz Khan um, from 2150 to you as well on uh, what kind of technologies you think private sector firms can invest in to accelerate the adoption of cities? So I will answer both questions because I was thinking about answering both anyway. So I want to sort of say on the predictions for cities that I am somewhat allergic to sort of grand narratives around this. I sort of think the same as Omar, cities by and large do well and if i'd been designing london i would never have designed it the way it currently is but it's very nice um i also think that we can go terribly terribly wrong with these sorts of things so if you walk around london you can't help but see jane jacobs streets in the sky in all of the downtrodden and derelict housing commissions near where i live in hackney and that is a massive level failed experiment that is building something without understanding how it works based on a theory. And in the end of that, things don't go necessarily well. So we think that what we need to do is find places where we think there's an advantage to government or private sector doing something and try and work out whether it really works carefully and then only do those things where it's really going to be beneficial. So my answer to Shanaz, and thanks for the great question, is, well, I'm not uh, a futurist. I don't know what cities need. But if you're in the private sector and you have an idea about how something's going to work, maybe that idea is profitable, in which case go forth and seek financial funding and do what you do as an entrepreneur. However, in some cases, there's going to be some very specific bottleneck I would call it a market failure because I'm an economist, but it's some reason why, despite the great uh, prospects for your idea, things aren't working out. So let me give you an example. So in the United States, I think it's something like 15% of methane comes from city dumps, city um, disposal of, of food scraps. And it's very plausible to capture that methane, uh, it's the rotting organic matter, and to burn it as a source of, electric, uh, of fuel for your electricity. Um, why is this interesting? Cities in the developing world face a problem with, with um, it's not called sanitation, garbage collection for want of a better word, and, and want to find ways to solve that problem. And a private entrepreneur may be able to enter and make money out of that methane by creating electricity. So if that's the case and the private entrepreneur can enter, that's a private sector development thing and it would help with climate change. On the other hand, it's very plausible that it's hard to enter that market for a very easily understandable reason, which is perhaps it's very hard to get scraps 
uh, separated out into things that are organic matter and things that are not organic matter in order to make this financially viable. If that's the case, that is a reasonable thing where government and a research organization like the IGC could get together to try to understand what does it take to get people to separate out their garbage. And if we do separate out that garbage, can we get some kind of private enterprise involved to do this kind of thing? So that's my suggestion for private enterprise. Identify the things that are the roadblocks for you trying to make a difference. Work with organizations and with the government to try to understand whether those roadblocks can be fixed. And once they're fixed, then go forth and do what you do and make money. Um, but thank you for everyone. Uh, I think it was a, a wonderful uh, session. Cheers. Great. Thanks so much, Jared. Um, so I'm going to try and sum up uh, this discussion, which I think has been incredibly rich um, in five small points, which is which is no easy task. Um, so I think we've heard primarily about uh, turning migration into an opportunity rather than a challenge or seeing it as an opportunity rather than a challenge. Um, and cities being providers of opportunities for development, for adaptation and mitigation. Um, I think we've heard that we shouldn't forget about secondary cities um, in particular in that process, and also about thinking how we need to understand more about who these migrants are um, and not just as numbers. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about integration. So um, what Sandra said about uh, sort of uh, social cohesion and building trust in cities as well, but also looking at uh, labor market in integration and how you know we need to think about the different skills that um, migrants need when moving to cities as well. Um, we've spoken about infrastructure, of course. What would, how could we talk about cities without that? Um, and the fact that people are already here, they're in the cities, driving up land prices, making it more expensive to invest in that infrastructure. So we really need to think about how do we build for those people um, through planning, through service delivery, um, thinking about adaptation of those services and infrastructure as well. Um, we've spoken quite a bit about the need for data. Um, uh, not just actionable data, but uh, also just thinking about how we use that in running cities efficiently, um, how we need to gather, process um, that data, and also think about the infrastructure to get that information to the decision makers as well. Um, I think the final point I'm going to end on, because I, I do think it's one of the really important ones that uh, Yakama mentioned earlier on, is that if we don't have the resources for this, it really is just storytelling. So, you know, how do we think about really getting this to the implementation stage? Um, and, and great sort of tip to um, the question we had about the role of the private sector in that as well. Um, so with that, I want to just say a really big thank you to all of our speakers. I think it was a really, really rich and interesting discussion and also to the audience for your participation as well. I'd also like to remind you about the feedback survey. Um, please, if you could take a minute to fill that in later on, it's really useful for us to make sure that our webinars and events are the best that they can be going forward. Um, I also wanted to say lastly, please do continue to follow us um, uh, either on Twitter or other platforms. We will be publishing a number of blogs and policy briefs over the coming month of Urban October linked to this theme. Um, so please do watch out for that um, and we'd love to get your thoughts on those as well. Um, but to all, thank you again everyone and goodbye for now.